Well, thanks for being here, people. We've got um, seven of us here in person and four online. Nice to be together. So for anyone joining, this is a drop-in group twice a month. <clears throat> and um, for those who've been coming regularly, in case you were wondering, so we've been moving through this list of 10 virtues and we're on the seventh one, which is truthfulness. And so the last one, the 10th, will be June 8th, and then we're gonna take a break, probably till January. And then in January, kind of start the group up again on a similar topic. Um, a, teacher, a teacher of mine, teacher of a lot of us out on the West Coast, Gil Fransdahl, I haven't studied with him, but he's well known. Um, he has a manuscript called The Equivalence of Ethics and Enlightenment, which I've read some of and have really liked. So I'm thinking I'll start that next January, but um, that's a ways away. So yeah, for this group, we usually sit for 30 minutes and I'll offer some instructions. Um, Jessica's wondering if we could turn a light on. So Cam, would you mind turning on that spotlight? Appreciate that. Thanks, Jessica. <clears throat> so yeah, so I'll lead a guided meditation for about half an hour and uh, then we'll, I'll give a talk, share some thoughts on this topic of truthfulness or honesty, straightforwardness, um, and then we can have a little discussion about that together. So for now, we can just settle in to our own experience. So arriving here and now. We could say we're inviting into our awareness the truth of our experience, the truth of the body, and the truth of the mind the truth of how it is for us right now. Making space for that. Receiving that, so maybe emphasizing a receptive attitude, not needing to control our experience but simply seeing if we can relax and let in the truth, the simple truth, not good or bad, just how's the body right now? How's the mind? Sort of like taking a pulse on our experience and seeing if it's okay, if it can be okay. Maybe pleasant, unpleasant, mixed. But seeing if we can make room for it and relax, relax around it. And moving from the level of stories and concepts, Thursday night, my life, April 27th to a more direct, truthful relationship with our direct experience. The body feels like this now. The heart and mind feel like this, energized, tired, uplifted, downtrodden, scattered, calm. The body warm or cool. Energized or tense.
and maybe sensing a kind of joy or happiness or calm from this willingness to connect with our experience, even if it's imperfect, unpleasant, not exactly as we would like, but just this absence of deviation from the truth of our experience, not telling yourself stories of how we want it to be or how it could be or should be, not getting lost in regret over the past or anticipation or worry about the future. Noticing that there is a pleasantness, a simple pleasantness to resting in the present moment experience. One aspect of the truth of our experience is that there is a body, not our idea of a body, but this dynamic unfolding of sensation and energy, pressure, release, tightness, contraction, flow of breathing, sensation, temperature, relaxation or tightness. This is all happening in the realm of the body. And we don't have to relate to it as personal, something that we judge, think is good or not good enough. But we can relate to it on its own terms What does it feel like? That's what the body does. It feels. And again, we might sense a subtle happiness in meeting the body on its own terms when so often we're disconnected, not aware of the body. and relating to it with kindness and acceptance. It may be unpleasant or pleasant or mixed in different parts of the body, but we can relate to it with kindness and relaxation, acceptance, coming home to the body letting it express itself and receiving that.
So instead of trying to get somewhere, some experience we imagine from point A to point B, we're just going from point A to point A of just relaxing, settling, widening our attention to include more and more of what can be known here and now without looking for anything in particular, trying to have any particular experience we associate with meditation, but just knowing what can be known and appreciating the simplicity of that. And there can be a sense of grounding in the truth of our experience, simply the truth of awareness, knowing something being known. That's all that's happening moment by moment. So let's continue in silence, finding a way to sustain interest in this, showing up to the moment in a simple way.
Whenever the mind becomes aware after being lost in thought, you can remember that whatever we're aware of, maybe the result or the effect of having been lost in thought, that that's just now something being known. The way the body, heart feel, now that we're aware, it's just something to be known now. Oh, a little agitated, tight. So we're interested in this perspective of something being known because it's simple and it's true. When we look in that way, that's what we find. It's always something being known moment by moment. When we're trying on that perspective, you could say it's a radical simplifying, but it doesn't deny or repress any part of our experience. We're just remembering that it's something being known here and now. We're remembering to keep that perspective in mind. And when the mind feels like it's getting caught up in some drama, then we remember that there's a body. And the body may feel agitated or caught up, but we can find aspects of the body that maybe are calming or pleasant, just the sensations of the hands making contact wherever they're placed, or the butt on the cushion or chair, this sense of being grounded, connected to the earth, can help us relax, settle, give our weight over to the earth that's holding us up. And continue opening to a simple truth of whatever's being known moment by moment. So let's continue for just a few more minutes.
So I'll just take a minute or two, and if you need to get water or stretch, we can do that. Okay, so like I said, we've been moving through this list of 10 virtues, um, which is, um, yeah, I find a really inspiring and really practical list and teaching, and we've been covering it since January, and it's a drop-in group, so happy that, that folks are dropping in. And really, when you dig into any of them, you really dig into all of them, like with truthfulness, um, you know, metta, goodwill is in there um, because the reason that you're truthful isn't just for its own sake, but it's because you recognize um, that it supports trusting relationships to be truthful um, and being truthful with our own experience. Um, yeah, so there's, they all kind of interplay and um, but I, I find it's a really beautiful list and one that's yeah, really applicable to daily life. So um, yeah, we've, we've come a long way through generosity and ethical conduct and renunciation and wisdom and energy and patience. I think that's been six, maybe I missed one. And now we're on the truthfulness and then there's determination and goodwill and equanimity left. Um, yeah, and I think one thing I have been saying this whole time is the context in which we think about these, I think is important that it's not just something to aspire to, but it's um, something that helps us in life. Like for me, I find that remembering these, and I have these cards that I, I was gifted on a retreat that has each of these with sort of a short description. And I find that they really help me clarify, yeah, especially in the messiness of daily life where there's, things feel complicated. They just help me remember a perspective beyond just kind of my own story, and um, but a perspective where there's sort of a higher value that informs kind of how the heart can rise up to meet to meet life and something sort of like a, if you don't have a value or you don't have the, like a bigger context, then it's easy for the floods, which we talked about the first time, the floods of clinging in different ways, basically to kind of flood the mind. Um, so these are, yeah, our ways to cross the floods of life. So they're not just um, personal virtues, they're, um, yeah, they're kind of perspectives that help us um, help the heart rise above maybe its, its ordinary tendencies, which, you know, towards self-centeredness, you know, like with truthfulness. If you don't have a commitment to truthfulness, then it's really easy to, you know, justify lying and deceiving and manipulating, even in subtle ways. You know, it's not like even has to be outright deception or manipulation, but just that slight shading of the truth for our own benefit. And so, yeah, these sort of um, virtues sort of shine a light on, on our mind and its conditioning and help us get clear about that, which is sort of the whole point of this particular one of truthfulness. There's sort of two dimensions of it. One is more ethical in our relationships just the value of the kinds of relationships that we can have, trusting relationships that really depend on truthfulness, um, depend on being able to trust, trust people to tell the truth and that people trust us to tell the truth. Um, and then the other dimension is kind of with ourselves, how truthful are we with, with ourselves? Um, but it really is at the core of the Buddha's teachings on mindfulness, like I was talking about in the guided meditation, um, just this willingness and this growing capacity and building the skills to meet our experience, we say, as it is, 
um, there's a value there uh, that our, our, the awakening or the freedom from suffering that the Buddha talked about isn't, um, is, is a function of getting clear and of, um, it's a function of a shift in our perception. And so a lot of the Buddhist teachings are just skillful means for, um, you could say, correcting our misperceptions or just, yeah, pointing to ways that we tend to cling, um, try to hold on to experience in ways that don't really work and just helping us get clear about that. And mindfulness is really the engine of that because mindfulness is that capacity to be with our experience, not as we hope it would hope it is or wish that it would be, but as it actually is just the truth of the body and the mind in this very direct way. And then wisdom is what kind of makes the cause and effect connecting the dots and sees, oh yeah, when the mind intends in this way, has this intention, acts in this way, you know, on different levels, when we act in this way or think in this way or even intend in this way or even view things in a certain way, this is the effect so that it all has it all has an effect and that that matters on the level of what we're really interested in, or at least what I'm really interested in, being a free, happy, loving, joyful human being. Um, so just connecting those dots. So I'll speak a little on sort of the ethical dimension and then more on the truthfulness internally, um, but they're both related as I think will, is clear, um, or will be clear, hopefully. Um, I'll start just by reading, so Ajahn Suchito is this British monk that some of us, we've been reading a book as, a, as we've been going along. And then these cards that I mentioned, which you can also get online, um, have a short description for each of the virtues. So for this one, he writes, recognizing the wise relationships that can be established through my own veracity and through the trust of others, I aspire to free my mind from biases and devious behavior. And so that last um, sentence, I think, is sort of pointing to both the dimensions in a way, because they're obviously related, but you know, the more in, on the level of intention, I think the commitment around truthfulness in our speech is really helping us get clear about all the ways we might justify <laughs> devious behavior or yeah just ways where we we bend the truth a little bit to our benefit or sometimes a lot of the times i think it's out of fear um fear of um being seen you know in a certain way and um or fear of others reactions if we were to be honest with them and yeah just to acknowledge that and um But to also acknowledge that we, when we're, when we're sort of acting in that way out of fear, or, you know, we're, that's the point of the, of the encouragement around truthfulness, is not necessarily in and of itself that, um, you know, we can see it as an ethical guideline. But in terms of a training for our own mind, it's really to illuminate. You know, if I'm if I have this commitment to to be truthful because. I recognize that it, um, you know, people can trust us and it sets in motion trusting relationships. Then every time I notice that my mind has the inclination to not tell the truth, I'll just be more interested in that. Like, why is that? Why do I, is that really, the, is that really true that I can't be truthful in this situation? Or might there be a way to be truthful and maybe there's just more creativity needed or more courage needed or more kindness needed? Um, because uh, in terms of speech, the Buddha said he had guidelines uh, for speech um, that it should be truthful, it should be spoken from a mind of goodwill, so wanting ours and the other person's benefit, um, spoken at the right time. So, you know, it might be kind and it might be true, but if someone's rushing out the door, you know, it's not the right time. You know, they have to be in a place to hear it, basically. And 
the fourth is it should be spoken, um, even our tone matters, like it shouldn't be spoken harshly. So it was a very high bar <laughs> for speech. And also there is uh, encouragement to not engage in idle speech, you know, speech that just fills space or gossip. So there's a few more guidelines. So it's really, um, yeah, it's a high bar. And I think one of the reasons speech gets, it gets its own of the eight path, steps on the Noble Eightfold Path, it gets its own step, wise speech. I think it's just because it's so impactful if we, um, we just think about it, you know, how often are we thinking in our own minds the, th the places we have, you know, hurt in our relationships from something someone has said or something we've said, you know, and the, just the impact that our words can have, that words really carry a lot of power and intention and we can use our words, you know, in ways that cause harm and we can also use our words in ways that really uplift people and make them feel appreciated. So, um, yeah, it's worth being really careful, not in a tight way, but full of care. And the nice thing about having, in my, my opinion, having a guideline like truthfulness, which is pretty across the board encouraged, like the Buddha really had a, yeah, basically no exceptions. And obviously we could think of exceptions, <laughs> But the point is, I think, in terms of mind training, to at least try that on or to consider that and then to look at all the places we think exceptions are um, justified. And maybe there are. It's not, I think, meant to be an ultimate truth. Um, but, but what I was going to say is the nice thing about having it as at least like uh, a working hypothesis, like, do I need to lie? ever in order to be, you know, a kind, functional human being that takes care of myself, takes care of others as best I can. Um, it's just, it, it's a mindfulness spell then, like every time there is the intention to be a little less than honest, then to look at that. And in my experience, more often than not, uh, it's some, yeah, some wanting to skew the truth a little bit to advantage me. And I think that where, where this kind of coincides and overlaps with our interest in truthfulness in our own perception and in our, you know, being truthful with ourselves is that the more that we're committed to truthfulness with others, it really supports being truthful with our own experience. Like in order to represent the truth in our speech to others, we have to have been mindful to some degree and being, been able to say, oh yeah, no, this is what happened. You know, you said that. And then, you know, this reaction arose in me and that's what happened as opposed to, you know, um, you know, a more blaming sort of perception where we're, we weren't really aware of kind of the cause and effect unfolding of what happens in our experience. And um, for those people who've studied nonviolent communication, I know Carrie uh, Slow has been uh, leading a group, right? Yeah. Um, and I just know a little bit about it, but I, when I first learned about it, it just really made an impact because it feels really aligned with our mindfulness practice of reflecting you know, our own experience and not jumping to conclusions. And I think that's one of the main things in terms of the power of truthfulness in our relationships and especially when there's conflict is that we can sort of stand on our truth without having to, um, yeah, even when there's conflict, without having to blame ourselves or others, we can just reflect the truth that our experience and even our own reactions and our personalities are conditioned experiences. They're not actually that personal, even though they do feel very personal. But when we, with mindfulness, again, this is kind of them both coming together with mindfulness and with the encouragement from the Buddha to see our experience in this conditional, lawful, natural way that it's just nature, cause and effect. You know, instead of seeing this is my anger, we see this is the nature of anger. 
anger arises under certain conditions. And if we're able to come from that place in talking with others, say, yeah, when, when you did that, it made me feel like this because I value that. And that's sort of a nonviolent communication format. But I think, you know, anything like that where we're really reflecting out loud, not the way we think it is, but what we can actually know, what we can actually say from our own experience. And the truth is we don't know, we, unless we're mind readers, we don't know what other people's intentions are. So all we can really reflect is, you know, when you left the dishes out, <laughs> it made me feel um, impatient because I value cleanliness and I value people being sensitive to how they impact others in the space. And you know the person may then reflect back, oh yeah, I, I um, was aware that that could impact people, but I was in a hurry or whatever. You know, so we're just moving. Yeah, we're moving on to the level of understanding that we're all what we are is just conditioned unfoldings, and if we can relate in that way, it just helps helps us understand each other better. In my experience, when I've had conversations like that, even if it's, you know, it's still what comes out is, yeah, you know, hurt was caused, um, you know, there was maybe unskillful intentions in my mind or in the other person's mind. But at the end of the day, I don't find when I am able to have those good faith kind of conversations and even revelations, you know, it's because it's a vulnerable thing to admit how your mind is conditioned, you know, you know, our emotional reactions. But at the end of the day, it seems then to just bring about this perspective that, um, yeah, yeah, well, there's less room for blame then, and there's less room for essentializing someone as a good or bad person. But just, you know, if there's still good faith in the relationship and basic um, goodwill, then it's like, yeah, wow so easy to cause harm, it's so easy to be deluded, it's so easy to think you know, it's so easy to act carelessly out of, you know, just the desire, the different desires and fears that we have, fears to avoid conflict or being hurt. So that's a, a protection from the truth, is that even if we have acted unskillfully, if we can own that and come from it, not from a place of essentializing ourselves as being something permanent, but just you know revealing the conditioned nature of our minds, then we can sort of stand in that and say, yeah. Either we can say, you know, at times where people may, you know, have a problem with something that we're doing or did, we could say, oh, you know, I didn't know how that affected you. That wasn't my intention. We can stand in the truth of that. Or if it's something where we, we realize, oh yeah, you know, there was carelessness or there was, you know, something unskillful, but we can also acknowledge that. And in either case, we don't have to have the extra stress of sort of needing to defend ourselves habitually. There was a teacher, Ajahn Sumedho, who's a very influential teacher, one of the first Westerners to train in Thailand and is still a monk. I think he's in his mid-80s or something. Um, he said something in a book about when he receives um, feedback from people, criticism, even if most of what they say is like off the mark, but if there's even one thing that is true, that he, he practices taking that in and appreciating that because, um, and this is said explicitly in the teachings that what one definition of spiritual friends or good friends are people who are willing to point out our faults and uh, because how else are we going to see you know what we don't see so i i think this is really a beautiful part of of friendships that have that element of of honesty and i think it takes time and, and care to cultivate that because we have like with the buddha's um guidelines, it's, it's not just true. It's also spoken with the mind of goodwill. It's not just, hey, <laughs> did you notice 
this about yourself. <laughs> it's, um, you know, because I care about you, I think you're going about this the wrong way or something. So there's a lot, there's a lot here uh, in terms of relationships, but I think the, the general kind of positive take on it are just, yeah, the inspiring piece about it and what we can, we can cultivate is to look at all the ways that where we might justify not being completely truthful and just to, to notice the stress of that. And even when it feels like, oh, no, I, I can't, just to be curious about, you know, what other supports might be needed in order to have that sense of ease that comes when we feel like basically we're doing our best. I mean, again, our representation of the truth can only be as truthful as our perception of the truth, which is sort of the next piece of it. But at least we're not intentionally deceiving um, or manipulating. We're, we're people, you know, we want to be, I want to be people who speak forth, forthrightly, you know, and uh, honestly and straightforwardly. And in, in my mind, it just, this is an ongoing practice for me, but it, it feels like it really, it creates the basis for kind of all other positive elements of relationships because people basically, we feel like we can trust each other. So I'll move on now to talk a bit more about the inner truthfulness with our own experience. And this in a way is just the same, the same principles, but applied to how we talk to ourselves and how we make sense of our own experience. And again, like the willingness and the interest in not just seeing things as we want them to be, as we wish they were, or assuming we already know how things are, but just kind of this humility that we don't see everything. We don't see everything about our own experience. We don't see everything about others. We have assumptions about how things are. You know, this is just the way our minds work as they cut corners, you know, evolutionarily speaking, you know, this is just how our brains work. We're always assuming things, you know, we see someone on the street and the mind just, you know, is assessing if they're a threat, or if they're safe, if we're interested in them, if we're not, you know, what we think, kind of. So this is just kind of part of the mind's simplifying of experience and perception is just this, um, yeah, this simplification. So that's part of it, is that our perceptions aren't completely trustworthy, like we all know and like we all experience, we can think something is one way and then we realize it's not. The classic example uh, in Buddhism is um, seeing a rope and thinking it's a snake. Um, and there's interesting teachings on this that this happens on three levels. One is just perception. So you just see it and you do think it's a snake and maybe you, your body reacts. Um, and then if we actually think it's a snake and um, then we'll have thoughts about it, like, uh, I didn't know there were snakes <laughs> in the city. Uh, and so that's the next level. So the first is distortion of perception, and the second is distortion of thought. And then if you really walked away from that, still thinking there were snakes, then it could even evolve into a distortion of view, which is where you really have this view. No, there are snakes in Minneapolis. Um, and that could just become so, so ingrained as a view that then no evidence, con contrary evidence would even penetrate that. And that's, you know, that's really then a dangerous place to be, not necessarily with that view, but any view that isn't open to, to question. And we all know that that's something people are susceptible to. And so this, kind of is an example of why mindfulness is really important because with mindfulness, that's what mindfulness and wisdom is what gives us the chance to let new data in. Because like I was saying, we have so many biases already built in just through, for one, evolutionary conditioning and just the being a human, we have certain biases just built into our brains. 
And then, you know, just particulars of our conditioning. We're not a blank slate. We walk around, you know, making sense of the world in particular ways, some of which may be, you know, work and are helpful, and others which may um, be limiting or just wrong. And so mindfulness allows us to let in new data, data that isn't um, as filtered through those biases. And all of this theoretically, you know, can be applied to all sorts of different things. Like I said, like snake, there being snakes or not is probably not the most impactful thing in our lives. And we could probably live either in a city with snakes or without. <laughs> it wouldn't, we wouldn't probably move unless they were really <laughs> dangerous. <laughs> um, so the more important piece is where the, our views and perceptions around um, where we look for happiness. And that's really, again, the Buddhist teachings are always about happiness and suffering. That's really, they're very pragmatic on that level. So the, the views that we have about that, and so there's four classic misperceptions or distortions of perceptions that have to do with how we relate to our life, how we relate to the, the objects of our life, the people in our life, our own thoughts, you know, the stuff of our life, how we relate to it in ways where we cling and get caught. So the four are, we take that which is impermanent to be permanent. We pursue satisfaction, or I, I would say reliability, from that which is unsatisfactory or unreliable. We assume self where there is no self, where there's just nature. And the fourth is we see uh, attract attractiveness where there is unattractiveness. So I'll just go through these four. They're pretty classic. If you're familiar with Buddhism, you're probably familiar with them. Um, but I think the important thing is to not think of them just as theoretical, but to more be interested in how do they show up in our everyday experience in ways where we can either be more caught, more thrown off guard, more um, pushed around, or we can be more free and at ease with things as they are. So taking that which is impermanent to be permanent, on a conceptual level, we know that that things change, but still we tend to want things to be permanent, you know, we and we want them to be reliable, which is the second. These are all related, um, and we take them personally. It's, you know, it's, it's my thing, and that's part of why I'm disappointed when it changes. It's my relationship, so I should be able to control it, <laughs> and, then, and then it changes and disappoints us on all those levels oh, it was actually impermanent. I thought it was permanent, even though all of our experience previous is that things change, yet we still kind of hold out some hope to find some condition, whether it's a relationship or a job or health that will be permanent and reliable and something that I as a self can really depend on. So the reason that the Buddha talked about this isn't just to disappoint us, <laughs> but to point out ways that we're already struggling because we're sort of expecting things that aren't true. And so the idea is that we can, um, yeah, kind of wean ourselves off of these ways of expecting things to be other than they are, and that there's a positive side to that. There's a peace when the mind is less dependent on things being permanent, ultimately reliable, and personal. And so even just to imagine, like on the, po on the positive side, what a way of engaging with our lives that would be meaningful and engaged and um, you know what that would look like and whether that could actually be um, more engaged and more 
free of clinging and so more free to, yeah, to engage fully if we understood that things, that things are, you know, we, we engage with life not because we're expecting it to yield some ultimate end point where then i am got everything I want and I can rest, but because we're motivated maybe by these virtues, because it's enlivening to engage truthfully, it's enlivening to engage with goodwill, not because if I engage with goodwill, then, then I'll become you know, somebody forever that is loved or something, but because it feels good to engage from a place of goodwill. And the last scene, the unattractive as attractive, um, this is an interesting one, <laughs> but it really, as I understand, it really is about, in particular, sexual attraction and just the ways the mind can really be caught in that and take it as an inherent uh, attribute of bodies as opposed to a conditioned arising, again, conditioned by you know, evolution, conditioned by our our cultural conditioning to view bodies as attractive. And the point of the teaching isn't then to view them, I, wouldn't, I would probably not even say to view them as unattractive, but to view them, the, the analogy that's given in the teachings is just as you would look at a bag of beans. <laughs> it's like, it's just what it is. It's just nature. It's just, you know, I think of like, just different animals, like, or if there were aliens to come, they wouldn't probably be attracted to us, not because we're unattractive, but just because that's not, you know, they're not, they weren't, their conditioning isn't, isn't that way. So there are teachings, you know, to, partic- to, in, to specifically counter that tendency to view bodies as attractive and to view them more neutrally, like, well, what is a body? Well, there's skin, there's hair, there's phlegm, there's like this list of 32 body parts and you just lay it all out and that's what a body is. Um, so I've done some of those practices and I've, and I've contemplated this to some degree and I really appreciate this perspective. Um, yeah, because I think, yeah, it's clear just the, the power of this force of sexual attraction. And the point isn't to repress it, but to have as much space and perspective on it as we can. And in certain situations, having an alternative view may be really helpful when sexual attraction isn't appropriate for whatever reason, isn't helpful. And then in other times when it is helpful, then, you know, I think we could probably most of us find that conditioning there <laughs> to see bodies as attractive. But to see, I think the, the helpful piece in terms of view is just to see that it's, it's not an ultimate truth, it's a conditioned arising. And to be able to have some play with it can be helpful just for our own ease and freedom in navigating the world. So I think around these, these different perceptions, distortions of perceptions, I think a point that it's, it's important to me is, like I already said, but just to emphasize it, that I don't think the point of those teachings about impermanence, unreliability, um, non-self, um, non, not sexually attractive, I don't, they're obviously not ultimate truths. Um, at least to me, that seems... Like the point isn't to believe that, but I think, yeah, it's just always helpful for me to bring in the perspective of the reason for all the Buddhist teachings is, does it help us get more clear about areas where we tend to cling and to see the stress of that and to uh, imagine or intuit or experience, realize the possibility of non-clinging and the peace of that. So in terms of views, the question is more not is it right or wrong, but 
is it skillful, is it useful as a sort of medicine to counteract, you know, ways the mind may be clinging? You know, that's why the Buddha encouraged us to contemplate death, because it helps us realize that we may be clinging to life and not, you know, letting in this truth that we, we do know that the body will die someday. And how often do we really let that have its effect? And the point is to sort of have this sense of spiritual urgency, like we don't know the time of our death. So what really matters? What's, what are we really cultivating that, that is reliable or more reliable? So any of the teachings, any of the skillful means are just, we just assess them to the degree that they're helpful. And that's, that's a helpful perspective because then we don't, you know, like the death contemplation. For some people, at some times, that just may not be useful. And what's needed is more soothing in the sense of the teachings on goodwill, the possibility of really abiding in a state of goodwill, you know, because if the or the contemplation on unattract the bodies is unattractive, there's actually a case in at the time of the Buddha of someone who was contemplating that and they took it too far and really were seeing bodies and their body as repulsive and committed suicide. So it's not an ultimate truth. It's just a correction if it's useful, if that's if that's what's useful in the moment. And on this point, there's a famous discourse called the Kalama Sutta of these people, the Kalamas, who were really confused by all these different teachings, uh, not necessarily the Buddhas, but a lot of different spiritual teachers, all propounding spiritual teachings and all saying that only theirs was true and all the others were false. And um, they were confused and they went to the Buddha. And so this is a famous discourse, and I think it's it's helpful because the Buddha is sort of giving his take on how, how do we assess whether a teaching should be followed. And there's all sorts of ways that people do assess and make their decisions about what to trust, basically. But the Buddha kind of pairs all of them away. And so that, I'll just read what he says. He says, Kalamas, do not go by reports, by legends, by traditions, by scripture, by logical conjecture, by inference, by analogies, by agreement through pondering views, by probability, or by the thought, this contemplative is our teacher. So not just because someone's your teacher. Uh, When you know for yourselves that these qualities are skillful, these qualities are blameless, these qualities are praised by the observant, these qualities, when adopted and carried out, lead to welfare and to happiness. Then you should enter and remain in them. So even our own logical conjecture, inference, agreement through pondering views. So I think the point of that that I want to highlight is that any view, even on the level, as long as we're taking it on the level of concept, isn't really the point. The point is to see what qualities actually lead towards our own welfare and others' welfare. And that's what he says. And then he goes on to talk about, in particular, the classic um, unskillful roots in Buddhism of greed, aversion, and delusion. So when someone acts out of greed, aversion, you know, resistance, rejection, or delusion, not knowing what's going on, that doesn't lead to their welfare. And when someone acts out of their opposites, non-ill will, non-greed, non-delusion, and that's for their welfare. But he's saying we, we kind of have to see that for ourselves in our own experience, and then we'll, we know. Um, so any view, you know, just on the level of concept, definitely is useful, and we need, we need teachings in order to kind of point us and open our minds and make us question and think, oh, what would that be like? But it's actually applying the teachings and trying it out. What does goodwill look like, feel like in my, in my life? Um, where we can then actually see, and that's what we call insight. Oh, goodwill is freeing. It frees the heart from ill will. It feels totally trustworthy in the moments when our heart 
is filled with goodwill and there's no trace of ill will. Wishing well for ourselves and others. As one example. And I think this is helpful because one of the four floods that we talked about the first time, the ways our mind get caught, gets caught up, is the flood of views. Because we have, people have a tendency, we have a tendency to take views as a source of psychological ground. Now that I have this view, the right view, you know, whether it's about the perfect utopia, whether it's the spiritual teaching, now I have it. But if now I have it, then I have to defend it and I have to, you know, maybe debate other people. And if it's just a view on that level, it doesn't actually liberate our hearts. It's like having a perfect plan for the rest of my life. But on that level, it's still just a plan. It doesn't do it for me. So the teachings are all, they say in Zen, fingers pointing at the moon, but we actually have to look at where they're pointing and try them out. And then in our own experience, we can see whether they're helpful. So the Buddha talked a lot about this, about views and the danger of clinging to views. And it's kind of a favorite teaching of mine. <laughs> Especially these days, because uh, one of my views is that the divisiveness and polarization in society are being amplified, in particular by social media as the main arenas in which we even converse. And those platforms are not designed to they're not neutral, just like our brains aren't neutral. You know, our brains are conditioned by, well, by ignorance in Buddhism, but also, you know, evolution. But the platforms are designed to get as much of our attention as possible. And that tends to actually um, be exploitative of sort of more um, reactive parts of our minds as opposed to more frontal cortex or bridge building or um, so that's a whole thing so maybe I'll leave it there let me just see if there's anything else I wanted to say yeah and I'll, maybe I'll just open it up and um, let me think about how to do this with this size group We'll pull these people back. Yeah, maybe if people don't mind just coming in person, coming a little closer, and then I can rotate the computer so people at home could hear you. That would be great. And I'll turn the TV on here so we can see people. So yeah, we just open it up and any uh, questions about anything I said, or just your own experiences with truthfulness, both in terms of it being a, a support for, for our relationships, and then in our own experience, how are we um, yeah, practicing being truthful with ourselves, and um, yeah, yeah, whatever comes to mind, it'd be great to to hear from folks, so I'll just open it up. So we're almost out of time, but yeah, I really appreciate everyone being here. Um, yeah, why don't we just take a minute, let go of the words, appreciate being together, settling into the truth of our experience just as it is. And we can share the merits, which is a traditional Buddhist practice. So just, yeah, just reflecting that it's, um, it's a skillful thing to come and be in community and reflect on these values that can support us in meeting our life just as it is. And the more we're able to do that, the more we're able to show up in our relationships from a grounded place, a truthful place, 
And so any goodness that comes from our good intentions, we can consciously share that with the beings in our life, our family and friends, loved ones, people we live with, and outwards in all directions. May all beings be free from suffering and free from the root causes of suffering. May this be so. Okay, have a peaceful night, everyone. So the next parmi determination, I'm excited for that one, <laughs> uh, will be the second week in May. So whenever that is, and feel free to come. Okay, have a good night, people on Zoom.